For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. 16. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Be seated and let's pray. Lord, I am extremely thankful to have uh, your holy text before me today. I am zealous to want this congregation to have an increasing hunger Sunday after Sunday. I am wanting to see their journals open, their, their notes being, being feverishly pursued, their learning being, being uh, dominant on their mind, the, the sound of turning pages of Bible to be a, a sweet sound in the ear. Lord, we do this for our comfort and to your glory. This has been the reading of the word of the Lord. May these receive it as such. Amen. Just by way of, of, of a couple of easy questions, how many of you have a job at the moment? Okay, how many of you have had a job? All right, that's pretty much all of you except the young ones here, and some of you need to get one fast. How many of us know and recall those times where we have to get trained on certain issues in our job that seem like these trainings never cease. Like we've done this a hundred times. A hundred times. And, and after a while, it's just like, oh, gee, another meeting for the same thing that we covered the first quarter that we'll do the third quarter, but now it's the second quarter. Well, these t trainings, these teachings, we tire of them. I'm looking at some of my military friends here, and you have to do this over and over again with your Marines because for the most part, they're knuckleheads. But we're knuckleheads too, aren't we? We're all knuckleheads, even when it comes to the thing of the Scripture. Well, in my industry, you know, you guys know me as the pastor of The Rock, but I'm also the, the owner of Ag Partners, or what we call 210 Ag, 210 Companies. And in our agriculture side, we, like most in the fresh vegetable industry, have to constantly train in food safety. And in every food safety meeting, the employees, oh, exhaust themselves, they guffaw, they make all manner of noises and grunts, because in something as simple, and I'm looking at some of you also in ag, you know, like in the case of hand washing, this is a strict thing in agriculture. And historically, they've always been five steps, and we train on them, seriatim, multiple times each year. Now, you are thinking, training on hand washing? The answer is yes. And the five steps are that you, that you wet your hands. Wow. <laughs> Novel, right? The second one is that you apply soap. The third one is that you scrub your hands. But not just scrub your hands, it's also, and you work yourself in, in your, your hands and your fingers into your fingernails. And not only just that, but you do it for 20 seconds, not 14, not 11, 20 seconds. The fourth step is you rinse your hands properly and thoroughly. The fifth step, historically in food safety since 2006, has always been that then you dry your hands. But here a couple years ago, the food safety rules had to change, and so there was a sixth added and throw away a single-use towel into the receptacle. Well, I tell you, when I train my employees on that, when employees or farmers and, and supervisors are trained their people, they're on their phone, they're doing whatever. They, like, they're like, yeah, I know how to do that. But you know what? I write up my employees, and employees get written up every time because supervisors watch, watch them return from the, from the urinal, and they don't do the 20 seconds. And they probably don't do the, the towel and so I, I transition to this. Some of you might be like, can't we just move past 
the doctrine of justification by faith? Can't we just move on to something else more important or more meaningful? We've already been talking about this for weeks. Listen, no, we can't. We cannot move on from the doctrine of justification by faith because it matters. It's supremely important. It's more important than the six steps of hand washing. Well, today I intend to show you from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, uh, two contrasting realities, two contrasting realities regarding the text. And you will see that I've titled for you this morning in my sermon, uh, the receiving of God's promises, the receiving of God's promises. Now, under these two contrasting realities will be three points that follow for each. So here's what I want you to do first. Uh, Paul talks about, in this text, the promise. Here's what I want you to do, you note takers, and I hope that's all of you. I want you to draw a, a horizontal line, that means left to right, then kind of bifurcate your paper, divide your paper in half, and just draw a line across. So you're going to put some content on the top of this line, and you're going to put other content below this line. So you're going to draw a line horizontally on your paper. And then I want you to leave just a little bit of space on the left side, and on the right side to then make a, a vertical line from top to bottom on each side. So you're going to now have a little space on the left and on the right where you will come back later and you will write some things on the very edges. But very, very minimal room for that. So here's what you're going to write on the top section as the heading. It's the promise via works. The promise via works. This is what you see on the screen is going to be in the top section. That's, the, that's going to be your heading. There's going to be the contrasting realities. And then on the bottom at Bottom section, at the next line, below that line, is going to be the promise via faith. The promise via faith. Okay, so there's your framework to take your notes in your journals. Uh, let's jump right into the text. Verse 13, for the promise, here's that phrase, the promise, for the commitment, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law but through the righteousness of faith. Now, th there's a lot here. I could only wish that I could cover 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 in the breadth of everything that's here, but there's a lot, so we're just going to have to kind of skim over the, the wave tops, but I think you will, you will find it meaningful. This idea of, of, of the promise, let me just take us back to an incredible deposit to the human soul via the first book of the Bible, Genesis. This idea of the promise, I, I want to help you to, to see what was meant by this idea of the promise. Now, I'm just going to read these to you, and I'm going to read them quickly. Uh, Genesis uh, 12, 2, and verse 7. This is idea to us about what is Paul referencing regarding this thing he calls the promise, 12, 2. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. That's 12 too. And look at verse 7 ahead. This is to Abraham. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. That's 12, 2, and 7. Look ahead to chapter 13. Now in chapter 13 we have verse 14. And moving forward. The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the, the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. This is uh, another subsequent idea of the promise. Look ahead because God is a promise-making God. Chapter 15. In chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as uh, righteousness. There again is sample evidence of this idea. But God continues this, this revelation, this clarity, this uh, deposition of giving him vocally what he is going to do for him. Chapter 16. In chapter 16, uh, you see more of this in verse 10. 
uh, verse 10 says, The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that you cannot be numbered for multitude. That's in 16. Now, again, we also look at 17. Again, I love how God does this. This shows you divine condescension, doesn't it? God wants to make sure that you hear him. God wants to make sure that you hear him and that you believe him. God is, does this for your sake, not for his sake. It's for your sake that he does this. And again, you, you see the same thing in 17, in, in 1 to 8. This idea is, is common of this promise. And again, in chapter 18, verse 19, is the same thing. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household to keep the way of the Lord by doing right and justice so the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So see, this is the idea of this promise. God has promised from all eternity past that he was going to do for, for Abram, Abraham what he said he was going to do. So we go back to our text. We go back to our text. And so under this idea of the promise via works, Paul is telling us, he's telling Abraham, he's telling the Jewish people there that the promise to Abraham and to his offspring that he would be the heir of the world, that they would get the promised land. This really means that they would be possessors of the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God would be available to them, that all this promise, all this work, all this gifting, all of this uh, assurance that this was going to be to Abraham, but not only to Abraham, but to all those who would come after him, to all those who would believe, to all those who would, would trust in Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying. That's all, that's all he's getting at. That it did not come through the law, but it came through the righteousness that came by faith. This is how Abraham was made righteous. This is how you will be made righteous. So the first thing you're going to write, the first three observation that we, that we see under this idea of the promise via works is this, that it can't be inherited by the law. It cannot, you cannot get the promise by the law. So in the top section, number one, it cannot be inherited by the law. Neither Abraham was granted this promise by the law. Isaac wasn't. Jacob wasn't. And if those three won't, you won't be either. They got it via faith. You will get it via faith. You can't get it via law. But this is why we have to go over and over and over again to these things because it's really easy for us to begin with faith and then transition to something else because that's the human condition to always convert to a different way. Works, for example. Now, it's the promise of God. Now, you're going to need to do this for me. Also jump ahead into the book of Galatians. You should probably keep a finger in Galatians and a finger in Romans because I'm going to make a lot of references to the book of Galatians. Galatians 3.2 says, Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is evident. No, you didn't get it by the works of the law. You got it by faith. So this is what Paul says there elsewhere in Galatians. Let me make a few, a few comments here. This idea of the promise is important. Like, have any of you had someone that made a promise to you that didn't keep it? How does that feel? Exciting, doesn't it? Isn't it great? Don't we just love that? No, it's an important thing. And if you make a promise to somebody, it's, it's expected that you're going to keep it. People want you to keep it. And, and we promise because we, we, we want the person to have assurance. We want them to have peace. We want them not to worry, to not be overcome with anxiety. I, I, I promise it's going to happen so that we can sleep at night. Well, this is what is, is meant here by, by God. It's, a, it's an important part. And for Paul, the word promise is, is significant, very significant. He uses it uh, many times. Matter of fact, it's 52 times used in the New Testament, 26 times alone belong to Paul. 26 times the word promise is used by Paul. Half in the New Testament, singular, are by Paul. And so what do we see from Galatians? What do we see from Romans? Is that if we can be saved, if righteousness would come to us, the righteousness of God, if it would come to us via works, then it can't come to you via faith. So it either has to come one way 
or it has to come the other because it doesn't come from both. It either comes from one or the other, but Paul says it doesn't come by works. But some of you, like I can, it's really easy to believe that maybe it helps. Maybe it contributes. Maybe it's slightly important. No, works belong to the Christian life, but they don't belong to the Christian life to get righteousness. They belong to the Christian life because of righteousness. You can make a distinction that we've been doing this every single week for weeks now. So this is what he's getting at. And keep this in mind too. The Jewish person in error understood that Abraham already was meritoriously righteous by God on behalf of God because they viewed him as fulfilling the law before it came. So they viewed him as already being obedient to a law that had not yet existed. And that is why God gave him righteousness. So you can see why Paul has to combat this because that's a pernicious lie that can be propagated in any culture that we would believe that by the works of the law that we can be justified. No, you cannot. So that's what we get at here. And we know from Galatians 3, verse 17 and 18, how many years later did the law come? 3? 45? How about 430? Galatians 3, 17 and 18 says, the law came 430 years after Abraham. So we see, we can't get confused about when he was made righteous. And likewise, you cannot be confused about when you are made righteous. But we get back to the text. So in Galatians 3, Paul is asking that goofy question, which is goofy to him to ask it, because the Galatian church was under the same error. See, the Galatian church was, was subject to Judaizers, people of Jewish descent who saw the Gentiles converting to Christ, and they were converting to Christ without ceremonial attachment. And so without the ceremonial attachment, they told the, the new converts, you should get circumcised. Add circumcision to your faith. And Paul rails against the Galatian church. Like he goes nuts. In fact, listen, Galatians is the only letter of Paul that he doesn't even grant a thanks and a greeting to. No thanks, no greeting, no, no, I'm thankful for you. He just pulls out his switchblade and goes for the jugular. He says, how can you be preaching another gospel? Let, let him be anathema who teaches such a thing. He's, he's upset. Because people are trying to rob people of the joy they can have by simple salvation, by faith alone, in grace alone, by them trying to pollute it by adding works. That's the book of Galatians. Well, let, let's jump to verse 14. Because we see that we can't get the promise by the law. So let's look at verse 14. And this verse 14 is magnifying the absurdity of such a, 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 an idea. For if it is adherence of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. This is the same repetition that keeps coming forward to amplify verse 13. This is simple amplification. It's saying the same thing. Is that even if someone believed that they were adhering to the law, belonging to the law, performing the law, excellently so, then if that was true, then faith is null. Faith has zero value. And then, in that case, the promise that comes by faith is really at odds with what God has said all along. This is what Paul is getting at with verse 14. If doing the law gets one saved, then we have no need for faith. No need for faith at all. So the next thing then you would write in the top section, which Paul is reminding you, reminding you under the promise via works, is if we can get it, the promise via works, then it's, it's, it's no promise at all if it comes by the law. It's not even a promise. Because why would he have to give you what you're due? Why would he have to give you what's rightly yours? We call those wages, don't we? Remember, gift versus wages. If, 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 if Russ works for his neighbor for 40 hours a week, for the guarantee of 20 bucks an hour. At the end, Russ is expecting his wages. Now, if his, his friend comes and says, hey, I want to give you a gift of, you know, 20 bucks an hour times 40. He's like, that's not a gift. 
You owe me this. Right, we, we understand that. Paul is saying to us quite simply that if it could come by the law that we can be righteous, then we don't need the promise. And faith is useless. This is Paul's argument to the Jewish person that was putting emphasis and stock in works being the vehicle by which one was made righteous. But have you ever done the same thing, church? Answer yourself honestly in your heart. Have you tried sometimes? Have you tried to make sure that everything is just exactly right? And maybe have you become imperiled when it wasn't exactly right? Have you maybe tried in your own mind to, to keep a, a checklist of, of putting the boxes that are checked here and this is for the Lord, this is of the world? Because you're trying to make sure those cosmic scales at the end, you have enough work on the end, that's what you're hoping? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. This can be us quite easily. So then, under two, it isn't a promise at all if it comes via the law. Go back to Galatians. Galatians 2.16 says, Yet we know that a person is not justified, made righteous, saved. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Verse 16 is full of repetition, isn't it? It's over and over again, repeating the same thing. He says this, then he says it this way, then he says it this way, then he says it this way again. Because we're slow. We're obtuse. We're, 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 we're reticent to grasp the obvious. Because again, we are bent to believing that it doesn't come so easily. Well, your Bible is consistent from cover to cover. And see, this biblical doctrine of justification by faith alone is potentially one of those things that you get tired of listening to. But listen, if I can't preach this to you, I don't want to preach anything to you. If I have to preach to you that you're saved by works, I'm preaching to you something that will never afford you a thing. I'm preaching to myself something that's never going to matter for me ever in the end. If I can't preach the doctrine of justification by faith alone, there is nothing to preach. There's no such thing as grace. So of course we're going to be here. We're going to visit this over and over and over again. Paul repeats it because we are naturally, every single one of you, we are naturally bent towards works. Uh, the, the theologian Roger Nicole says that by nature, we are, quote, semi-Pelagian. Semi-Pelagian. That means Pelagius was a, was a third century heretic who believed that a human being had the ability to do good redeeming works in his soul. And so the semi-Pelagian position says that we are pretty corrupt, but not totally corrupt. So we're semi-corrupt. No, we, we can still bring forth goodness. Well, it's simply that it's not possible that we can do this. Uh, Martin Luther, in the, in the 16th century, would say it in a different way, and he would say it more naturally. He says, quote, It's very hard for a man to believe that God can be gracious to him. The human heart can't grasp this, end quote. How about you? Do you grasp that God can be gracious to you? Or do you like to, to beat yourself up over and over and over again? Or do you like to somehow strike yourself and flagellate yourself, believing you have to punish yourself additionally to make up for the lackings of Christ for you? Because you've been so, so, so bad. There's no one so dirty that God does not have sufficient soap to clean. And that's His grace. That's His grace that you appropriate by faith, my dear friends. Well, we looked at verse 13 and we know that the promise can't be inherited by the law. We looked at verse 14 and we know that it isn't a promise at all if it comes by, by works, not at all. So now let's go to verse 15. Because verse 15 in Romans 4 says, For the law brings wrath. Like, we don't use that word in our, in our vernacular. We don't use that word in our speaking today. 
Even if, even if you mothers have young children at home and your kids have been, have been acting up and have been off the rails on a sugar high for six and a half hours and dad comes home, you don't say, oh, you wait till your father comes home because he's going to show you some wrath. You just don't, we just don't use that word. You probably should. That might help. But we don't use that word. Your daddy's going to be mad. Your daddy's going to be a little bit upset. This upset that God has towards sin is not the same as his wrath. And God will visit wrath on sin. And this is what Paul is saying in verse 15, that God's not just going to be slightly displeased with us. He's not just going to be like, oh, shucks, you gave it a shot, but it's all right. No, the law brings wrath. And this is Paul's point, is, is to then chip away and erode one's confidence in trying to put your hope of receiving the promise via the works. It won't happen. And all that works is going to do for you is bring you wrath. That's it. I, I, listen, I don't know how to say this more clearly. If you are going to try to be saved via works, you won't get what you want. You will get wrath. Try with works, get the wrath. Write that down on top of your Bible. Try with works, get the wrath. Now why? Why would that be the case? Because if you do work, it must be flawless. There can be no error. There can be no impurity. There can be no lack. There can be no minimization of all that is demanded. That's why then if you want to try it and meet God's standard with the works of the law, then all you will get is wrath because you can't do it. Is anybody listening to me here today? You can't do it. This is Paul's argument. I'm trying to say to you the same thing. You can't do it. But so many of you are trying. There are denominations and, and religions around the world that are doing this very thing, trying to get to God via works, via deeds. There are even churches that call themselves Christian who have polluted the gospel of grace by a faith and have also introduced works as the way to bring about salvation. That's what happened in Galatia. That can happen in, in churches in this town or in any town is you introduce something else. It's not faith and, it's faith only. The works come after. The works don't come because. I mean, for. It comes because. So then the third thing that you'll write in the top section of the promise via works is the promise via works won't arrive if God's wrath is upon you. If I'm going to try it by works, God's wrath is already upon you. Listen, it's already here. Romans 1 says we're storing up wrath. We're just, we're, just, we're just building a storehouse and we're just packing wrath away every day, every moment with more sin and more wrath and more of God's anger because we're not measuring up. We're just storing up. Oh, doesn't that sound encouraging? No, but this is Paul's argument to us. You won't get there. You will not be saved. You will not be declared righteous if you're going to try to do it by works, all you're going to get is wrath. You think you're getting works? You're getting wrath. See, Paul is blowing a torpedo into the hole of this idea that one can be saved by works. It's not possible. Now go back to Galatians. Uh, Galatians 3, 10 and 11 reinforces this point. It says this again and again. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Curse and blessing is the motif of showing us the reality of works and grace. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Man, see, this is like another session on hand washing, isn't it? We keep saying the same thing over and over and over again because you struggle to believe it. You leave church, you leave a message like this, you leave your notes, and yet Monday morning you go back to trying to do it by work. And it's not going to work, my friends. It's just not going to happen. 
So what we've done so far is we've looked at this idea of the promise of, of the kingdom of God. We looked at the promise of us being heirs of the kingdom, of us being God's children, of God promising to Abram to deliver him. We've looked at that under the rubric of how is it possible by the law. It's not possible. It's not possible by works at all. So now we're going to begin to now look at the next contrast, and that is going to be where you write the second thing, but how does the promise look to get it via faith? So the top line was the promise via works. Now let's look at the promise via faith. We're going to turn the corner to the promise via faith. And I got to tell you what, let me just tell you right now, this feels good. Like it sounds good. I'm so thankful for the next section, and you better be thankful too. Because this is where the gospel comes, is what we see now, how we get the promise, and it comes via faith. Look at verse 16, because this, this is wonderful. It just, it just is music to the ears. It's a symphony to the ears. It, it, whereas everything before was just cacophony, here is symphony. It sounds good. Up there it just made no sense. Now it just works together magnificently. Verse 16. I'm a little bit excited. Yes, of course, I grant. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not just to adhere to the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who's the father of us all. Just, just, do, do, do you hear the repetition in there? Do you hear the beauty in there? Do you see the magnificence in there? Like this, is, this is so much. I mean, I could preach on, on, on just verse 16, all 35, 39 minutes, which has moved, seemed to move to 43 minutes the last many, many months. I'm sorry. Notice that it says here, and I'm, I'm just going to seriate them, kind of just pull these out uniquely. In verse 16, the first thing about this idea of the promise via faith is maybe you want to write it down or, or underline it. Certainly you're going to write it in your notes because you have that line there to, to prepare you here. It, it says... That the, that the promise depends on faith. It depends. It's looking to. It's counting on. It's foundational. Your house that you live in or your apartment that you live in has a foundation. It needs to be there. Or your house cannot depend on anything. Today's hurricane, for example, might test that foundation. But this same here about our salvation. It, it must depend on faith. It's not anything else. And notice that the next thing it says is it, it rests on grace. It looks to grace. It's, it's it empowered because of grace. Grace makes it so. Then it moves on to say, it's what? It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Have any of you ever been more frustrated than you buy a product? And it has a one-year guarantee. And so you take it to the establishment where you bought it. And, 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 and you take it to them. And, and, and it's, it's only three months in. And there's some, there was some fine tape, that, or some fine you know, boilerplate document in the, in the legal lease that you didn't read before. And you assumed it was a blanket warranty. And then you get there and they're like, oh, that's not covered. Oh, yeah, this you have to, you know, box it up and send it to the vendor who's in Toledo. And, and they have about a 19-week turnaround. But, but, but they'll take care of it for you. You're like, man, that's, that, that's a terrible guarantee. I, I just want you to fix it. Listen, God is going to give you salvation. God has already given you righteousness. It's guaranteed. And not only that, he's gone to prepare a place for you, the Scripture says. These are all guarantees that become to us why or how. Grace, how do you take advantage of it? Faith, this is incredible. And to who is this all available? To those who will, the text say, those who will believe. I don't see very many smiles on faces. You should be smiling like crazy. This is the greatest news ever. Which brings us to the very first point under the bottom section of the promise via faith. It is inherited by one's belief. And I use belief there to be coterminous or, or to be synonymous with, with trust. I'm trusting in Jesus. I'm trusting in Christ. I'm trusting in God and what He's done and what He will do. I'm not trusting in me. I'm trusting in Him. But how many of you, again, are trusting in you? Yeah. 
It's really easy to trust in you. It's wrong to trust in you. It's better to trust in Jesus. It's inherited by one's belief. What better news is that faith and grace work together? They belong together. Matter of fact, grace must be there for you to exercise faith. And faith is exercised because there is grace. These are, these are, these are wonderful, shiny sides of a coin that we are seeing this morning. Now, go back to Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, we have verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. If you here today have faith, you are a son or a daughter of Abraham. In the extended sense, absolutely. That's the whole point of what Paul's talking about. Look at verse 9. So then, again, amplification, reiteration. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of works. Is that what it says? Where does it say? Help me, I can't read. The man of faith. One more time, the man of what? The man of faith. See, this is great news. So that's, that's the first thing you see under the promise to be of faith. But let's look also immediately the second thing. And the second thing is that it is not only given, but it is also guaranteed. It is not only given, but guaranteed. This is the second thing you see about the doctrine of justification by faith. You know what is, is just kind of crazy? How many of you, you were here for my Corvette example in my, in my sermon for for, you know, receiving, you know, the, the, the air and the, the sign and the seal. This, for, for, for like the last month and a half, I've been looking for a used vehicle to buy for my farm business. And uh, I found one I wanted in San Diego. And I'm going back and forth with the person. It was a great deal. I've been looking for much for the right one. And this was a sweet deal. And I had some good conversations with the guy and I wanted to make sure that, that he didn't sell it out from under me because I couldn't get there quickly. And so, so I, I uh, sent him, a, 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 I wired him a $500 deposit to his bank account. I learned by the end of the day that that was a scam. And I was thinking about my sermon. Like, how could I be so gullible? Like, I, like I, I asked him if I could see a picture of the title. Just, 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 but, but, but the way he carried himself, the way that our conversation had gone, I'm thinking, this guy's legitimate. And so I trusted him. Well, guess what? I came back from uh, El Cajon on Thursday with a different vehicle. But do you think I was a little bit more careful? A lot. I am pretty much convinced that maybe some of you have been convinced that works matter by someone who was pretty good of the tongue. And maybe as in, so much you've been someone that was good at speaking, it is something you've believed because you think that that's the way. Listen, that, that, that's a scam. It's a scam if any of us think that we're going to get to heaven and inherit the promise. By works, it's not going to happen. Just like that vehicle I sent 500 bucks to, I got nothing. This is what your works are going to do. It's going to get you nothing. It's going to get you nothing. So this idea about a guarantee, nothing else in the world, my friends, is this secure. Nothing else is this secure. Nothing. Now let me jump you all the way ahead to Hebrews. Hebrews 12.2 says that we're to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter. Some versions render perfecter, finisher, which means he begins your faith and he finishes your faith. It doesn't transition to somebody else. It's him in the beginning. It's him in the end. This is the promise via faith. This is how you get it. What an incredible thing that we see in Holy Scripture. Well, let's move forward. Verse 17 is going to wrap up our text this morning. And in Romans 4, 17, our text says here, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence 
the things that do not exist. Paul, like uh, a, a, a marine with, an, with a saw or an M60 with a machine gun, like this is what Paul is, that's a cool lesson. That's a machine gun, in case some of you don't know. Or an A-10 with a, you know, coming down. I like that, it just sounds so fun. This is what Paul is doing about trying to get to heaven via works. This is just machine gun fire. It's not going to happen. And this is what, what 17 is doing too. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I must make you laugh. But this is what he's doing by adding another element in verse 17. He's saying in this verse that it is God who saves. He says in this verse, it is God who calls. He says in, in, in 17, it is God who creates. He says in verse 17, it is God who gives life. He says in verse 17, it is God who resurrects. He says in verse 17, it is God who sustains. It is verse 17, it says, it is God who makes out of nothing everything. This is what Paul is saying in, in just 17. It's not you. It's him. It's never been you. It's always been him. Works is what inverts that. Faith is what keeps it right. Now, in case you wonder, like, why does Paul present this kind of, where well, there's nothing? Do you remember about the promise to Abram? Do you remember about the promise? Abram was an old man, a very old man, which means his wife was a very old woman. Very old men and very old women don't have babies, right? They don't have babies. Or maybe they shouldn't, but they don't. It's just work with me here. Work with me. <laughs> Abram's old. Sarah's old. And so why this in your text about from nothing was because both he and his wife were beyond the ability to have children. So how in the world could this come about? By their power or by God's power? Answer me, will you please? God's power. How was a Christian person saved? By God's power or by your power? God's power. That's the picture. Ex nihilo, which means out of nothing, God made everything. And from the time that the first promise was given to the time that the actual promise received was 25 years. At year 12 and 13 is man's effort to introduce works. That's when they come up with, let's take, go to my handmaid. Go to, go, to the, go to the servant girl. Maybe that's how the promise is supposed to come. And here comes Ishmael. But that wasn't the way it was supposed to come. That's the, that's the works way. But it comes the God way when the promised son comes later. And we know in line with the promised son is somebody else, isn't it? Absolutely. So the last section, the last third thing under, under our line here is the promise via faith, is founded and secure in God's work, not mine. And I, I wanted to personalize that. And in your, as you write there, you underline mine and underline God's. The promise via faith is founded and secure in God's work, not in yours. In yours, not in yours, it's in God's. You can't unsave what God has done. If you try it by works, you'll never get there. I promise you, you can never do enough. Back to Hebrews. Hebrews 11.8 goes on to this idea of, of, of a failure. And, and, and Abraham is, is, is showing us by this Heroes of the Faith chapter that by faith he did it because he knew he couldn't do it on his own. And he went far away and he trusted God. But well, he didn't know where he was going to go. He just went. He did. He trusted. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 5 to 9 will bring forth this same idea. It's founded and secure in God's work, not mine. 1 Peter 1, 3, 5, and 9. This will tell you the same thing. Now, what I want you to do here as we get ready to close. At this point, you have two sections in your notes. You have the top section, which is what? The promise via works. And you have the bottom section, the promise via faith, right? Now, in the top section, on the left, let's, let's drive this home a little bit more. What you have there 
is trying to get the promise via the law. So write the law in that little slender section on the left. That's the law. Works attaches with law. That's law. But now in the lower section, under the promise via faith, you're going to write the word grace. That's where grace is. That's where grace is on the bottom. Law's on the top. Grace is on the bottom. But we're not done yet because the good news must continue. Now on the right side, and here's where we're going to close, and here's where you, you want, I want you to really think about this as we leave this place today. On the top, on the right side, is a me focus. Write that down. That's a me focus. I'm focused on me, what I do, what I'm doing, how I do it. So then what do you think is on the bottom right? A God focus. On the top, I'm looking at what I'm doing. On the bottom, I'm looking at what God has done. Do you see the beauty here, friends? And there is no, you have heard this morning the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel, friends. That it is not by law and the works of the flesh that any will be justified, but it is by grace through faith that we have been saved. And that not of yourself. It is the free gift of God, lest any man should boast. Today, I want to disavow any of you from believing you can get to heaven via your works, because all you're going to get is wrath. But if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, the promise is guaranteed to you simply by faith. That because of grace. May that resound in your hearts and minds today, tonight, and this week. Let us pray.